Uh, you're all very welcome to this first in-person meeting in two years. Yeah? Uh, it's great to, to see so many familiar faces rather than just seeing them as little thumbnails on, on a Zoom screen. And it's, uh, it's great to see some visitors here as well. Uh, you're doubly welcome. Uh, my name is Declan. I'm secretary of the Cork Astronomy Club. Uh, because I know a lot of you are visitors, may not have been with us before and are joining us as well online, just a, a two minute tour of the, of the club. Um, our aim of the club is to promote an interest in all aspects of astronomy amongst our members and, and the public. We have a public lecture program as what we're doing tonight. And then for members, we do Saturday morning workshops on all things astronomical. We have a monthly observing group and a rapidly expanding astrophotography group. Uh, we're a social kind of a crowd, really. We like to travel around to do things. So we have, thanks, John. So we do an annual outing every year. Well, obviously not for the last two years, but generally we do. Uh, this year we're going to Burke Castle, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but we've been everywhere from West Cork to the West Coast of America via Vatican, Vienna, Prague, Amsterdam, Greenwich, Bath, and other ones. Um, this shot here actually was 2018 when we visited ESTEC, that's the European Space uh, Agency Technology and Engineering Center. Um, great trip. Uh, so yeah, we do tend to get around a lot. Uh, we have Christmas event, Christmas dinner, uh, and solstice barbecues, things like that. So there's a whole kind of social side to the club as well. Uh, we're 44 years old. I know we don't look it, well, some of us anyway, uh, but we are around 44 years, founded in 78. Uh, I think we have about 150 members thereabouts. Yeah. So we're probably one of the biggest and longest lived clubs in the, in the country. Independent and democratic, touch on that again later. And we're part of IFAS, which is the Irish Federation of Astronomy Societies. Okay, so we are now on to the main event. Uh, I'm just looking at the screen here. Yes, Paul has rejoined us, which is great. Um, Professor Paul Callanan, uh, Professor of Physics here and Astronomy here at UCC. Um, he's going to talk to us about gravitational waves and black holes. And this is Paul's special area of interest and research. Uh, and really, I can't wait to hear uh, all about them. Paul has been a very, very strong supporter of the club down through the years and is a, an honorary lifelong mem member of the club. So, Paul, we'll hand over to you. Um, but um, this evening, what I want to do is to uh, just talk to you a little bit about, um, as the lads were saying, an area of research that's very close to, uh, to my own heart, studying uh, black holes um, in our galaxy and beyond, um, and searching for a particular type of black hole, which at the moment seems to be only something that we can detect through the observation of this relatively new phenomenon in astronomy, the detection of gravitational waves. And so my talk will be bound up between talking about black holes and talking about gravitational waves. The gravitational waves bit will come in the kind of second half uh, of the talk. So, um, <clears throat> so to start off with, then I suppose even before I launch any of that, it's very peculiar for me to be showing this picture this evening because uh, you guys can, you know, um, not quite turn over your shoulder and look out the window as you could if you were in the uh, Civil Eng building. But of course, it's, it's very near all of those of you who are present in, in Boole um, this evening. It's the Crawford Observatory, uh, you know, constructed in the 1880s and represents very much the pinnacle of astronomical technology at that time, um, built by uh, Howard Grubb. And of course, Howard Grubb is part of a long line of extremely talented and very well-known Irish makers of, of telescopes and instruments. And uh, certainly, if any of you have not had a chance to get to Burr, um, as the lads were talking about earlier, 
it really is um, a visit very uh, well worth making because it sets the context of really Irish, you know, and astronomical ingenuity um, from the 1840s, certainly to the 1880s, as you have with the observatory here. And, you know, some of the, I suppose, telescopes and techniques that we're applying today um, in the modern day looking for, um, for black holes. So the thing about um, telescopes like this, though, uh, is that, of course, they, they, um, back then, the biggest that you could make would have been telescopes with lenses maybe of the order of a, a foot or, or so in diameter. And of course, um, astronomers, uh, regardless of whether it's for the study of black holes or, or any um, other type of astronomical object, we want to get as much light as we possibly can to our telescopes. And really the best way of doing that is to make them as big as possible. So this is a, an image I, I'm, I'm sure I've shown the club once or twice already, but here it is again. This is astronomy now stepping forward 100 and, um, 120, 140 years from the Crawford Observatory on the campus to what will be the biggest optical telescope in the world, which is the European um, Extremely Large Telescope, the European Southern Observatory, ELT, which would have a mirror in it, the equivalent of about 40 meters in diameter. So. I'm guessing if you look at the floor of the Boole Theatre you're in now, imagine uh, an area of that size being um, entirely one perfectly made mirror that you could point at any place in the night sky. So this would be, it'll be a unique instrument and it'll rival things like the James Webb Space Telescope and, uh, and other observatories in its capabilities. And just to get a sense of its, its size, this is the ELT, if you imagine that putting it behind the, the city hall, but its height would be just about the same as the Elysium Tower, getting up to around 60 meters, as you can see there. And so that just represents some of the astronomical technology that we've been able to develop over the last few decades. And it's with this technology, of course, that we've been able to study many different phenomena, including um, black holes. Um, in a minute, I'll talk a little bit more about how we study um, these black holes and how we need telescopes, not only like the ELT, you know, very big telescopes that are ground-based that uh, give us information in the optical part of the spectrum, but other types of telescopes as well um, that orbit in space. But I'll, as I said, talk about that in a second. So kind of, as I said, part of the subject of my talk is talking about black holes, and I suppose it makes sense to um, wonder, you know, where do these black holes come from? And, you know, there are a variety of ways that we can, we can make black holes. And um, the kind of black holes that I do most of, of my research on are ones that we find floating around in our own galaxy, uh, mostly, and in other galaxies too sometimes. And most of these black holes were made by the, uh, during the evolution of, of massive stars um, a little bit like what you see in the upper part of, of the diagram here. <clears throat> a massive star, you know, 10 times, 20, 30 times the mass of our sun, um, exhausts all the fuel in its core, and that core eventually collapses where the outer part of the star might actually expand. And the, the catastrophic collapse of the interior eventually um, involves a, a supernova explosion. Now, there are various di different types of of supernovae that you can get, but in many circumstances, especially for the most massive star, that supernova is most likely to leave behind a black hole. And these black holes typically weigh about, uh, of the order of maybe 10 times the, the weight of the sun um, or a little less. Now, I suppose that's the first point about black holes that people might get the might have had the, the idea that black holes really are these very, very massive objects indeed, with this incredibly strong gravity, which of course is true for black holes. Um, and that's one of their kind of defining characteristics. But really what's important for a black hole, uh, in addition to the, 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 its weight, is how compact it is. Because all of a sudden, in the case of a black hole, you have this object, as I said, that might be 10 times the, the weight of the sun or the mass of the sun. But instead of 
having a, a size of the order of maybe a million kilometers, it has a size maybe of the order of a few tens of kilometers. And as some of you might know, the, the force of gravity that we feel uh, due to another star or another object, or even the person that's near you in the Boo Theater this evening, the force of gravitational attraction that things experience depends on the distance between these things. And the closer you can get to an object, the greater the gravitational force. And of course, for the sun, the closest that you can get is about 700,000 kilometers or so. But you can get to within 10 or 20 or 30 kilometers of the kind of black holes that we're talking about here. So they're still relatively massive, but you can get very, very close to them. And it's the combination of those two things which makes the gravitational force so strong outside a black hole and makes it one of the most extreme objects that we, that we have in the universe. You're all familiar too with this idea that if you get too close to a black hole, no matter how hard you try, uh, you can't escape and light cannot even escape and um, this, this region called the event horizon around it. And inside a black hole, you know, the density essentially is an infinite one of any material that actually happens to be sitting um, in the center of the black hole. I mean, for a star like the sun, the typical density is about maybe a thousand kilograms for every cubic meter. So it's about the density of water, a little bit more. For um, a star that's called a white dwarf star, which also can happen from the evolution of a, of a star. And in fact, our sun will eventually evolve not to make a, a black hole, but to make something called a white dwarf. That's still relatively dense. That's, a, that's about a million times denser than the stuff in the, in, in the sun. So a cubic centimeter of that material would weigh maybe a million tons or so. But the densities in the more extreme objects that are left behind these exploding stars, and especially black holes, are, as I said, essentially infinite in the very core, in the very core. So these are um, very extreme objects. And because of that, they're a real challenge to try to uh, understand from a, a physics point of view. They really represent a very extreme laboratory where we can actually hope to try to understand and test some of our most advanced ideas in physics um, to see if they work. Because if, if they can work in an environment like a black hole or near that of a black hole, then they can work anywhere. Um, so that's part of the motivation for why we're so interested in, in looking for these black holes. Part of the issue we have is that it's, it's very difficult to do because, you know, black holes, as the name implies, don't emit any radiation intrinsically that would make them visible to a telescope in the way that a star or a galaxy or, or almost any other astronomical object would. And so we have to employ very um, kind of clever means to actually find these black holes um, in our galaxy. Um, and in fact, I, this is an image I was going to use um, just of the night sky taken with my, um, with my iPhone, is that if you just follow, you, many of you will know, of course, that if you follow Orion's belt um, over to Sirius, that Sirius has a companion, which is the remains um, of a companion star that Sirius had that exploded and left a very compact object behind. This particular one isn't a black hole, but it's a very famous example of a, of a white dwarf, still a very extreme object um, in itself. And so, you know, many of these remnants that are lying around in our galaxy, so to speak, and are visible by various techniques. But we also know of many other, even more exotic types of remnants, um, including, as I was saying, um, these black holes. But to actually talk about how we find these stars, I have to tell you a little bit, again, something that many of you would, uh, would know, um, but still just to kind of give you a, a, a kind of more complete picture, that as I was mentioning, the um, observations that we make, especially to find objects like black holes and other extreme ob um, objects, really can't be made just from telescopes that are visible, that, that are sensitive, I should say, to the visible light that we can see with our naked eye. And we really have to look at other parts of the spectrum to see the radiation that really helps us identify whether um, a black hole or other exotic object is there or not. 
So, um, you know, some of you might be familiar with, uh, with this idea of the electromagnetic spectrum. The most fundamental idea is that the light that's um, kind of buzzing around in, in the room right now that you can see going into your eye actually behaves a little, a little bit like a wave. And light, from, uh, light that has, um, let's say, is particularly energetic, has a, a wavelength that is relatively small, whereas light that is not so energetic at all, that might actually be in the radio part of the spectrum, um, has a much longer wavelength. Another way of looking at that is, is that you know, light uh, in the form of an X-ray with this relatively short wavelength is very, very energetic. And so we can penetrate things and it comes from gas that's um, very, very hot. Whereas lights, um, let's say in the, maybe the optical part of the spectrum, the type of light that we, that our eye is sensitive to, um, it is not that energetic. On average, it's about maybe a thousand times um, less so than say the x-rays are. And that's more, that's more easily um, absorbed by gas and dust floating around in space. And it's made by, by stars of the order of um, our sun with a temperature of maybe kind of 6,000 degrees or so. So depending on how hot an object is, its spectrum will be dominated by uh, light. Some, often if it's very hot, a light that is, that is emitted in the form of X-rays and very energetic waves like that. Whereas if the object is very cool, then the, the light that it emits, the radiation that it emits is less energetic and might be more towards the red or the infrared part of the spectrum. And so the kind of um, radiation that we see from stars tells us a lot of information. And one important part of that is how hot the actual star is. Being able to observe um, all of these different types of radiation, and especially as much of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is the term that's given to all the different types of radiation that objects could possibly emit. This is an important thing to be able to do for astronomers. And it means that we have to do at least two things. The first thing is to, to make special detectors that are sensitive to this type of radiation because our eyes aren't sensitive to almost all of it. And the second thing is that we have to make telescopes that are also capable of, of recording this, this radiation. Now, sometimes we can be clever and we can do that um, from telescopes that are on the ground, but in other times it's impossible to do it from the ground because the atmosphere actually blocks off a lot of this type of radiation, especially the more energetic type. And it's the energetic type that's gonna be of um, real interest to us from the point of view of finding black holes. Exactly, as I just said, um, the most effective, one of the most efficient ways of finding black holes is indeed to look for um, this particularly energetic radiation and radiation that we would otherwise call X-ray. So this is exactly the same thing if you were to go into a hospital and get an X-ray. Uh, it turns out the stars emit quite often, certain types of stars are very good at emitting the same kind of radiation themselves, um, a very energetic radiation that passes through um, gas and dust, et cetera, relatively easily. And it's really, as far as the discovery of black holes are concerned, it starts with the discovery of X-rays from sources and a new type of astronomy that was invented, I'd say almost 50 years ago now, well, no, 60 years ago now, X-ray astronomy. So the early pioneers of this type of astronomy were, um, uh, very kind of uh, adventurous in the sense they, they basically said, look, we're going to see if objects emit X-rays. And they were bold because at the time, nobody really um, had any sense that there would be stars hot enough to emit X-rays. I said a little while ago, the sun at a temperature of 6,000 degrees or so, a little bit less, um, that's pretty hot, but it still emits most of this radiation in the optic part of the spectrum that we can see. And so, for a star to emit you know, X-rays in any large amount, it would have to be maybe a thousand times or more hotter. And at the time, it was not at all clear how you could ever find such a star that hot to emit X-rays. So that was one problem. 
And the second problem was, as I mentioned earlier, the Earth's atmosphere blocks out these X-rays in any case. And so you need to launch um, your X-ray satellite, X-ray detector rather, on a satellite over the Earth's atmosphere. And these people tried it and indeed it worked ex extremely well. And so this is fast forwarding um, maybe 40 years or so after the initial discoveries of, of X-rays um, from stars. And I'll start on the, with the bottom image first. This is an image of, of our galaxy, part of uh, the plane of our galaxy, but it's what you'd see if you could see, look in the X-rays. And so every dot and speck here is an object emitting X-rays. And the very bright objects are emitting X-rays, some of them as bright as 100,000 suns, 100,000 times the brightness of our own sun, and all of that energy is in the X-ray part of the spectrum. And so for some reason, there are indeed a large number of stars and some incredibly bright stars um, who emit um, tremendously in the X-ray part of the spectrum. So that was a puzzle right there. And then I'm just showing you a picture here of one of these satellites. This is the ESA, European Space Agency, XMM, X-ray multi-mirror observatory, which of course they're named after Isaac Newton, appropriately enough. Um, and so the idea is the X-rays enter from the right and the detectors then are here at the bottom for recording them. And this is, these are multi-billion euro uh, missions and, um, and it's been one particular aspect of astronomy that has really blossomed over the last few decades. Um, <clears throat> and of course, we see so many different things. So this is a, a combination of an infrared and an optical and an X-ray image of a, a supernova uh, remnant in, in Cassiopeia. And this is a star that's exploded and in the, and by doing that, it sent all this debris of material out into space. And we often see here, we can look at what this stuff is made of, and it's made of, of new elements that were created um, both inside the star while the star was still a star. And then some of these elements were made during the explosion itself. And this is another very important part of our, the story of stars, <clears throat> which I'll go back to in a little while. The very nature of stars is such that they're constantly making new elements. And of course, we are made of these new elements, right? The carbon, the nitrogen, and the oxygen, etc., in us um, started off uh, largely in the cores of, of massive stars, which then exploded, just like this star that I'm showing you here. So that gives you a little bit of a flavor of um, <clears throat> the importance of observing stars in the X-ray part of the spectrum and in other parts of the spectrum too. So just to kind of reiterate this, that, you know, there are many objects that we see a hundred times, a hundred thousand times more luminous than the sun in the X-rays. And the question is, well, how does that happen? And sorry about this, this text. What I want to do is to just go to a, an image rather than too much text. And so the idea is that if you have a little dot on the scale of this image, <clears throat> a black hole or an object like it would just be a little dot, let's say sitting where my arrow is there. But it has nonetheless this very strong gravitational force that I was talking about. And so that pulls material from its companion star towards it. And this material, as it leaves the companion star, spirals around in the, the shape of a disk, and this disk quite often emits these jets. These black holes, for some reason, are very good at making these jets. Um, and we can see this happening also in these black holes in, in our own galaxy. And because of this spiraling gas, as it gets closer and closer to the black hole, um, gets hotter and hotter, um, it gets very, very bright in the X-rays. And this is why we see all of these high energy X-rays from black holes, from gas that's sucked from the companion that gets heated up as it gets very near the black hole and, uh, and eventually emits X-rays. Before, of course, it passes across the event horizon of the black hole 
and disappears completely. So this is the process that explains the very, very bright, many, I should say, of the very, very bright sources, objects that we see in our galaxy. And it turns out it's also a very important process um, in detecting black holes everywhere in the universe, um, especially distant, very luminous ones. So very bright um, sources of X-rays in the galaxy are usually black holes. But there's still this problem that really to be able to study the black holes, we need to ideally have them in these, in these um, systems where there are other stars, as I've just shown you. This enables us to, uh, to do something else, which astronomers find a, a, a very useful tool in studying black holes and other objects. If you could imagine, I talked about the, uh, the light from a star earlier. I have a diagram there which represents something called the spectrum of a star. And some of you, this would make sense. For some of you, others of you, it, it may not. But kind of this, the picture I want to give you very broadly is that if you even uh, don't worry about the lines in the spectrum for the minute, but just look at the colors. So you can see it's a lovely spectrum with kind of purple, blue, green, yellowy, and it goes to the red. Um, <clears throat> Now, if you could imagine that the star generating this light was moving towards you very, very quickly, then it turns out that these, all these colors change very, very slightly, and they shift very slightly to the blue. It's an effect called the Doppler effect. You hear it with sound waves all the time for a source of sound that's coming towards you or moving away. And exactly the same thing happens with light. If you have a a star that's coming towards you, its light has shifted a little bit towards the blue. And if the object is moving away from you, its light has shifted a little bit to the red. And uh, a consequence of that is, is that where these lines, these uh, occur in the spectrum, uh, they move as well with the spectrum. But don't worry about that. But a simpler idea is just that the color of the spectrum changes depending on whether the star is going towards you or away from you. And this is a really important thing in astronomy because it enables us to, um, to say something about the speed of objects um, as they travel. We can measure their, their speeds or their velocities. And in astronomy, this is a key type of measurement because if you imagine here now looking at this red star, as the red star comes towards you, the color is shifted towards the blue. And as it goes away from you, it's shifted towards the red. And you might have had a chance of the spectrum here to see how it was shifting to the blue and to the red as that red star was, was moving around. Uh, I'm not going to go into any more detail, but the point is we can see the change essentially in the color of the spectrum because of the motion of the star. And that allows us to, to measure the speed of the star. Now, the reason why that's um, important for, um, for studying black holes is because if you imagine, you know, I'm going to try to wave my hands around in here. I'll see how far we get. But this is, um, this is a black hole. There's a black hole and there's a little star orbiting around it. All other things being equal, if the black hole didn't weigh that much, then this star could amble around at a fairly low speed quite happily and be in a stable orbit. But if this was a massive black hole, then the gravitational force would be much bigger. And now we might imagine that this, this star, again, all things being equal, would have to travel around much more quickly to stay in an orbit around that more massive black hole. And so by measuring how quickly the star travels around, how quickly, for example, in this case, the red star is traveling around, we can get a sense of how, how much the black hole actually weighs. Okay? It enables us to weigh the mass of the black hole. So the star is traveling very, very quickly and all of the things are equal, then that's a relatively massive black hole. If it's traveling around uh, much more slowly, then maybe it's not that massive a black hole or it might not even be a black hole at all. But the crucial point is that by measuring how quickly it's traveling, we get some idea of the, the weight of the black hole and we get some idea of how quickly it's traveling by looking at this, this change in color as the star comes towards us and comes away from us. So even though we can't see the black hole directly, by just studying the star 
um, that's orbiting around it, we can still find out a lot. We can measure the size of the black hole, the weight of the black hole, and we can actually then measure the X-rays that are generated by the hot gas that's sucked into the black hole from the same companion star. So really, finding these um, black holes in what are called binary star systems is a really important tool that we have for, for studying at least these black holes um, in our own galaxy. And this just, again, represents the same kind of thing as I was trying to explain. Object moving towards you, there's a blue shift. If it's moving away from you, there's a red shift. Um, this, that's a technical detail there. Some data we got a couple of years ago of a, of a, of a black hole and we were able to measure its, its size. When we do these kinds of measurements for, for um, objects in our um, galaxy that um, were left behind after exploding stars, what we find is that there's one group of them with a mass of maybe, a, or a weight, if you like, about one and a half times that of the sun. And then there's another group of them indeed with a, with a weight that's maybe about 10 times the sun. Now, these guys, are not black holes. These guys, about one and a half times the weight of the sun, are stars that are made of neutrons. And you know, another example of this kind of a star is a pulsar, a rapidly spinning star that's made of neutrons. <clears throat> so as, as exotic as these things are, they're not black holes. But these guys, which are objects that are 10 times the weight of the, of the sun, but they're not normal stars. We can't see any direct light from them at all. These are black holes. And again, the, the, the weights that we can measure here and for many of the measurements here are obtained from the kind of um, measurements I was talking about where we can see a companion star moving around the, the object. So we really see very clear evidence for black holes in our galaxy that are of the order of maybe 10 times the, the weight of our own sun. You know, so there's one um, bit of evidence for the existence of black holes in our galaxy. And there are other things we can do as well. And if I get a chance, if anybody asks me, it turns out we can even measure how quickly these black holes are spinning. But really, Without going into that detail, I want to go on to, to the next thing, which is to talk about black holes that are much, much more massive. How do we uh, know about them? So this is, um, it'd be great if this was a real image, but it's not, it's just uh, an artist's impression again of um, uh, getting very near a black hole and you can see the event horizon uh, in the sense that you can see the event horizon the very center of the black hole, the singularity, and this swirling gas around the outside of the black hole, <clears throat> as I was describing earlier. Um, and this, now, this says it's half six in the morning. It might be too far off. And the reason I have this here is because um, you can look toward, uh, you know, the black holes I've been talking about up to now have, as I said, sizes about 10 times the, the size of our sun, a weight or a mass about 10 times that of the sun. But if you can ever get a, a, a direct line through to the a line of sight through the center of the galaxy, which you can at the right time of the night, um, you're looking there towards a black hole that's many millions of times the, um, the weight of our own sun sitting um, in, in, the, in the core of our galaxy. And the thing is that our galaxy, you know, this is an, these are important, um, this is an important result because there's nothing special about our galaxy. And so even that observation suggests that there are uh, massive black holes in the cores of, of lots of other galaxies as well. And I'll talk to you about evidence for that in a few minutes too. But before I do, this is an image that I've shown the club before. It's actually a movie, it's, it's relatively old, but it's still uh, one of the best um, of them that are around that show very directly why we have evidence for a massive black hole in the center of our own galaxy. And this represents um, a series of images, in this case taken over 10 years that have been greatly um, augmented since, of stars as they orbit around the center of our galaxy. So people have looked at these stars with very large telescopes 
under very good conditions and they've measured the positions of the stars and they've plotted those positions as a function of time over this time scale of, of 10 years. And you can see the stars lazily drifting around some of them. But if you pay attention, one or two seem to move very, very quickly. So there's kind of a zoomed in version here. So watch this guy in particular. There is the famous star S2. And as it traveled around, you would have noticed that it just, you know, was ambling around, not minding its own business, and then all of a sudden accelerates near the bottom of its orbit here and then keeps on going. And of course, what's happening here is that all of these stars are orbiting around the center of the galaxy. And <clears throat> some of these stars orbit very close to the center of the galaxy. And they are so close, some of them, that the gravitational pull of whatever it is in the center of the galaxy really accelerates them to very high velocities uh, for some parts of their orbit. And it's little more than leaving cert physics, maybe even junior cert physics, to use an observation like this to show that the object, the unseen object that's making that star travel so quickly has to have a mass of a few million times the mass of our sun. And furthermore, the separation between that unseen object and that star at this point is really, on an astronomical scale, is very, very small in, in absolute terms. And so you have, uh, you have the order maybe the solar system or something like that. So whereas here you have one star occupying the sun, occupying a volume like that, here you have an object that's a million times the weight of our sun in the same volume. And the only object that that can be is a black hole. And so these were the observations which eventually got the Nobel Prize a few years ago, um, which show that in the center of our own galaxy, we have this uh, supermassive, we have a, a fairly massive black hole, certainly much more massive than the black holes I've been talking about already, um, of the order of several million times and the weight of our sun. And this is just a more graphical representation of some of the orbits that people have been able to, uh, to measure. And of course, as I mentioned, this leads us on then to the, the natural conclusion then that um, there are black holes in all sorts of other galaxies as well. And again, um, mentioning Derek's image of M87 showing these jets, this could, I have to say, I'm not, I think this is also M87, but I, I'm, I could be wrong, but, it, but it's certainly an example of a, of a powerful jet of emission being made from some massive object in the center of this galaxy. This isn't our own galaxy now, this is, a, this is another one. And there is something in the core of this galaxy um, generating incredible power to create these, these jets um, of hot gas on these very, very large scales. In the case of M87, um, the black hole, that galaxy is close enough and the black hole massive enough that we can actually get an image. People were able to get an image of this black hole um, several years ago in the radio part of the spectrum by combining um, information from a large number of telescopes um, all around the world here. You can see even down as far as the, the Antarctic. Um, so we can actually image these black holes and see this hot gas swirling around them and even find evidence for the existence of, uh, of the shadow or evidence for the existence of the event horizon near the center of the black hole too. Um, although M87 is the only um, a black hole in a galaxy which has been imaged in this way, we have very, very strong evidence that in the center of every galaxy, there is a, a massive black hole. Um, there are various ways of, of um, surmising that. One is to, to basically look at um, the, the stars near the center of a galaxy and to measure how quickly they're all traveling. Um, and it turns out that we can use this as a, um, a kind of a, um, an independent estimate for the, the size of the black hole in the very center of the galaxy. And there are other ways of, of inferring, um, not directly, but using indirect means, that these massive black holes exist. And when I say massive, now I'm talking about, in some cases, masses of a few hundred million and maybe a few thousand million times the size of the sun. 
And so we've gone from 10 times the, the size of the weight of the sun to a few million times in the, in, for our own galaxy to hundreds of millions, thousands of millions uh, in, for these most, uh, most distant galaxies. And I'm just going back to this idea of X-rays for a minute, uh, I was kind of making a bit of a song and dance about how important these were um, earlier. And uh, another example of that is the fact that when people originally um, made X-ray pictures of the sky, um, this is an X-ray picture of the moon. There's the moon in the X-ray part of the spectrum. What they found was that there's a background of X-rays that they could see everywhere, everywhere they looked in the sky, there was this diffuse uh, glow of X-rays and they couldn't understand where these X-rays uh, were coming from. And then they built bigger X-ray telescopes and more and more sensitive X-ray telescopes. And what they were able to do eventually was to, to resolve this, this background of X-rays into millions and millions and millions of very, very faint, very, very distant sources of X-rays. And the conclusion is that this background is due to an almost untold number of supermassive black holes making X-rays everywhere in the universe where we look. And there are so many of them that they're all, the light from them, the X-rays from them is all merged together to give you a, a background of X-rays. And so this X-ray background is also due to these supermassive black holes in an almost countless number of distant galaxies that are making these X-rays. And they're making these X-rays in a way similar to what I talked about earlier, where they're, they're sucking gas from their environment and heating it up and making these X-rays. So this is an important realization too, that again, these X-ray measurements are also indicating that these galaxies host these incredibly massive um, black holes in them. And so where we've got so far is, you know, here, the kind of black holes I've been working on for a while, around maybe 10 times the weight of the sun. Here, black holes maybe 100 million times, maybe 1,000 million times. Here's our galaxy a few million times. There are a couple of others maybe a little lower than the weight of the sun. This is the powers of 10 notation now. I apologize for this. 100,000 times the, um, the weight of the sun, a million times the weight of the sun, a thousand million times the weight of the sun. But there's a gap. No black holes. Does, does nature work that way? Does nature, for some reason, make super duper black holes, kind of, you know, middle of the road black holes, and then no black holes? Okay. A bit of a puzzle. People were looking. There's some evidence maybe for some object that could be in here, but, um, you know, still a matter of debate, as they say. Where could this missing link be? Um, and this brings me on maybe a little bit longer than I had planned originally, but to the second half of the talk, which is really to do with gravitational waves. And gravitational waves, it turns out, has a major bearing on these, these missing black holes. Unlike telescopes and detectors and things that I've been talking about for a while, this is a, a gravitational wave telescope. Well, it seems a bit bizarre. I'm using the word telescope very loosely here, but it's basically um, a facility where you can send a laser beam down a very long tunnel and back again and do the same 90 degrees this way around and back again. And you can do this an awful, an awful lot and measure this length and that length to a ridiculous level of accuracy. Even from a physics point of view, it's incredible. And I'll show you about, about that in a second. Now, the reason you want to do that is because Einstein, of course, who had so much wonderful insight into so many different aspects of this, realized that if you have two stars, especially two compact stars, and maybe even two objects like black holes, spiraling in very, very close to each other, they, they send ripples 
they send a message through the space that's around them. In the same way that you, you drop an object in the middle of water, waves will propagate out from it. If you have two objects spinning around in water, you could imagine that a more complicated pattern of waves would be generated by them. And in the case of these stars, these waves propagate through space, the actual space around these objects and send a wave through that space. And this wave has a peculiar property. So if you imagine you hold up a circle, a hula hoop towards an incoming wave like this, it's coming straight at the hula hoop. What it will do is it will compress the hula hoop in one direction and restore it then. And then it will compress it in the other direction and restore it then. And you can see the idea here, okay? So if that's the original and it's, the wave passes and it flexes, it's squeezed together and then it comes back to normal. And then it's squeezed in the opposite direction and comes back to normal as well. So it's like that, normality, then like that, a normality. And so if, if you were standing here and, and somebody else was standing there, during this part of the phase, you'd be slightly further apart than you should be. During this part of the phase, you'd be probably your average distance apart. And during this part of the phase, you'd be closer than you should be. And then you'd be back to normal again. And as the waves pass through, this, this cycle continues. So by looking for the systematic changes in the distance between things as a wave passes through, you can actually hope to measure the gravitational waves in space um, that are generated uh, by things like this. That's the idea. Um, and so the idea is that, you know, you, you try to measure the distance very accurately in one direction, very accurately in another direction, and look for the systematic changes in those directions that will enable you to, to know that, in fact, you're seeing a variation that's due to a gravitational wave passing through. The kind of last part of the picture is that as these objects are moving around, um, in many situations, they're actually going to end up getting closer and closer and closer and closer until eventually they just collapse. They just collapse on each other and then um, the two objects essentially become one. And what that means is that if you imagine as the objects are very far apart from each other initially, um, the waves that they make in space might be pretty lazy, you know, up and down and up and down. But as they get closer, they go faster and faster and the waves are generated more and more quickly and then then they merge and that's the end of the waves. And so you can predict the pattern of these waves that are made. So here's the idea there. One object is going around the other, and then they're getting closer and closer. It's going faster and faster, and then it disappears. So the different types of objects that merge give you a different kind of predictive pattern of what the wave should look like. And you can compare this with what you actually measure. The challenge, as I was saying, is that this, this movement of space is minute. So over a distance of four kilometers, it, um, there's a change, 10 to the minus 18. What, is the, what does that mean? Um, well, it's a thousandth of the diameter of a proton. Does that help get the idea? I don't know. Maybe the best thing I can say, you take an atom, you divide, you look in the very center of an atom, you look in the particle of an atom, and then you divide it by the thousandth. And you can measure that over four kilometers. That's the accuracy that you need to find a gravitational wave. It, it took decades upon decades of, of different work from theorists and from research groups to show that this is true. This is a colleague of mine on the left, Neil Amurku, who may even have given, I'm sure, has given many talks to the, um, the club over the years. Neil, Neil passed away last year, unfortunately, but he made some very important contributions to the theoretical approach to um, studying gravitational uh, waves um, from black holes. And this is Kip Thorne, who um, you know, got the Nobel Prize for uh, the discovery of gravitational waves. We had a, a, a little kind of um, conference to celebrate Neil a couple of years ago, and Kip came over specifically in recognition of the work that, that Neil had done. 
So a lot of this background work to see whether we could find gravitational waves were made by really ta talented kind of theorists like this. But on the other hand, from a technical point of view, you know, there's and building something like um, these gravitational wave um, systems, it's the work of thousands. So this is one of the first papers, binary black hole mergers in the first LIGO observing one. And look at them. Okay, from A to Z. So it's a huge, um, huge effort. And, um, and they got them. This was a signal. And this is what you'd expect um, these merging objects and the detection of the gravitational waves that they generated. It, it's a reality and it's a new type of astronomy today that, uh, and again, for which these guys got the Nobel Prize. Now, you might ask very sensibly, what has this to do specifically though with, um, with black holes? Actually, before I go on to that, I should say that some of these gravitational wave sources um, not the ones involved um, as part of the black hole story, but, but other types of these gravitational wave sources. But during the events that make those gravitational waves, they're, they're so explosive that um, other chemical elements are made. And for example, things like, you know, like gold, most of gold, the gold, if you've only got gold rings on you or anything, most of that was made um, by two in spiraling, not black holes, but stars made of neutrons. And as they got very, very close together and they merged um, in the final catastrophic event, that merger process generated many heavy elements, including gold. And it's the dominant way that, that gold was made, for example, and many other different types of elements in this periodic table that are covered the same way. And so these very extreme processes are important in making some of the heavier elements that, uh, that we're familiar with, whereas many of the lighter elements were made in these explosive massive stars and, uh, and in other stars during their lifetimes. But back to these inspiring objects making gravitational waves that aren't mutant stars made of neutrons, but that are actually black holes. Because by looking at the shape of the gravitational wave, uh, wave picture um, graph that I was uh, talking about earlier, you can actually say with some confidence that, that, that you're observing a merger in some situations of two black holes rather than anything else. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that you can, with confidence, say something about them, the sizes of the black holes that are um, merging. And this is an example of a particular source, gravitational wave source, 190521. And the idea here is that you've got an 85 solar mass black hole, a 66 solar mass black hole. They spiraled in together. There was a, an explosion and it made this more massive black hole of 142 solar masses. Okay. And the thing for, for me is that, hey, you know, this is a type of black hole we haven't really found any place before. And maybe this is where these missing black holes are as these gravitational wave sources in these very distant galaxies. I didn't tell you that part of the story. These things are very far away. They're not in our own galaxy. Okay, so at least in other galaxies, um, there are these, um, these missing black holes. But of course, the second thing to think about is uh, those of you quick with the arithmetic would have realized that 66 plus 85 isn't 142, right? And, you know, there's a, a couple of masses of the sun that um, are missing. Okay, there's at least one solar. How much is that? 151 is it versus, you know, there's, you know, there's several solar masses that aren't there. And of course, what's happened is that that amount of mass has just disappeared in the process of the creation of this more massive black hole and the explosion that happened afterwards and the generation of these waves that have been traveling through space ever since. That a couple of hundred masses, uh, that a few solar masses has been converted into energy. The energy, for example, that's required to make the waves in space. 
So it's like looking at the sun and the sun in the blink of an eye is just converted into pure energy, it disappears forever. But this energy is generated, is created instead in the form, change, I should say, to the form of radiation or the energy that's needed to make gravitational waves, etc. So these are in very, very extreme things that, that happen. Um, but we're getting more and more evidence now um, of how often they occur and what their, what you might say, progenitors are. And this, in this particular type of an object, these, these so-called missing black holes. And so could any of these be in our own galaxy? And all I can say is that right now, part of the work we're doing is to see if that's true. We're going through many, many catalogs of billions of stars, which are all available um, for our own galaxy, and looking for signatures that might indicate that indeed there could be these missing black holes hiding even in our own galaxy. We haven't found them yet, but we're, we are trying to chase them down. At least now we know they exist in other distant galaxies. So it makes sense to, to start looking in a more detail in our own. I can talk about how we're trying to do that later on as well. So we have some idea how best to search and where to look. Okay, so stay tuned, stay tuned. And with that, lads, I'm going to stop and thank you all. I have another thing here to show you if you're interested afterwards, but thank you all for, um, um, for that. Thanks a million, Paul. Paul, as, as always, that was a fascinating and thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, when you think of the, uh, the engineering that has to go into creating something like Lego, the tolerance is so, so small, it's, uh, it's absolutely mind-boggling. Um, I'm going to copy Peter here, take a note, uh, and, uh, and ask the first question. You mentioned that there is growing evidence that there are supermassive black holes at the centre of most galaxies. Mm. Can you have a galaxy without a black hole at the centre? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. A, um, a big topic of this research right now is the importance of having a black hole to the existence of a galaxy at all. And whether um, indeed it's a requirement to have a black hole and um, have um, a galaxy like our own. Um, all the evidence points to the fact that to have a galaxy like our own Milky Way or any galaxy comparable to it, um, you have to have a black hole um, in its center. Now, why that is the case is that it, I, it's probably fair to say people don't really understand yet, um, but um, they do seem to be to play a really critical role in the formation and, and evolution of galaxies. Okay, anybody in the room who wants to be the first to ask a question? Thanks a lot for a fascinating talk. Uh, just question in regard to the, the size of the black hole in terms of uh, diameter is the scope in terms of the, the weight of that measuring the actual um well you know if you can take a picture of it like it was possible for that supermassive black hole in m87 then you've got the direct evidence um, that you need right there Otherwise, again, it's got to be something that is, uh, is a less tangible type of measurement. And so uh, one way of doing it is to, to try to study the matter as it gets very, very near the black hole and then um, find the point where it, it disappears or where it's much harder to find the radiation from that, that matter. And that gives you... Um, a separate kind of constraint on the size of the black hole. And, and there are ways of doing that. There are ways of tracking the, the matter as it gets nearer and nearer the black hole um, and then find the point where um, essentially it's much harder to see it. And you know then, if you assume that, that is very near the event horizon, then that gives you a, a way of figuring out where the event horizon is. Obviously, it's not possible to do it in any kind of direct way, but there are ways of of inferring these things. Um, Paul, I came across a reference recently to a primordial primordial black hole. Could you explain to us maybe what that is? Yeah, well, like, certainly. Um, it goes uh, way, way back to the early formation. Of yeah, the I mean, well, I suppose there are, there, are, there are two aspects to that. I mean, in the 
very early creation of, of the universe, it has been hypothesized that black holes could have been made um, spontaneously very early on. But there's also a puzzle now about um, the kind of black holes that I've been talking about, these really supermassive black holes, because, you know, you, you might think that, okay, maybe what you do is you start off with a, a kind of boring black hole, maybe 10 times the, the size of the sun, and it, maybe it accretes, it, it sucks gas into it and it grows into something bigger and bigger, and maybe it sucks in another black hole and it gets bigger and bigger. And eventually it can grow to being a supermassive black hole or maybe being a thousand million times um, bigger than the, uh, by the sun. And that might explain how these very massive black holes are in the centers of all of these galaxies that we see today. But as we look back at these distant galaxies and as we look back towards the universe as it was, um, very, very early on, we still see all of these huge black holes. And so whatever happened, they seem to have been created and, and grown at a very, very fast rate when the universe was relatively young. And how that happened is still a puzzle. So I'm not sure if these are quite the primordial black holes you're talking about, but there are certainly black holes that were present early in the universe and how they grew to be so big so quickly is, is a challenge um, for astronomy right now. Well, look, we, we, we'll hand over to, to Peter, so maybe, and Peter will handle the, the Zoom, the chat questions. Now, here's a question from Kevin. Can gravitational waves energy be harnessed? Be harnessed. It would be great if they could be but they're so hard to actually measure. I don't know how you could possibly store it any place. You know, it takes these catastrophic events in distant galaxies to make them in the first place in any way that we can even detect them just about here. So I think it will be very hard, impossible really to harness it and store it and use it again. Maybe in a couple of million years time, if we're still around and technology has advanced, it might be possible then, but, but not right now. <laughs> but thanks, Kevin. Uh, do you have any question yourself, um, Peter? You're generally the first to jump in with a good question. Well, yes, I, I was puzzled about the, almost the last thing that Paul said, there was missing mass of several mm -hmm. solar masses. And that, that and I didn't catch what that mass Paul thought had been converted into. Was it was it converted into gravitational waves? Part of it certainly was, Peter. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, it's you know, even in the case of the sun, which you know makes all the energy um, that powers everything that happens on the earth, um, there's a kind of similar process that happens there where You've got atoms that are being squeezed together to make new atoms. And as that happens, some of their mass disappears. And it's actually being converted into energy. And it's the energy that we see from the sun. And so it's a similar kind of a process. In the case of the sun, it loses about a hundredth of a millionth of a millionth of its weight every year that's converted into, into pure energy. And that's what we see as the, as, the, as the brightness of the sun, the light from the sun. And so um, it's something that's, that's relatively common, the way that mass is, can, can be converted into, uh, into energy. And then the energy can, can be, you know, be manifest in different forms. Well, the, the, this is the thing that's puzzling me, you see. I, I'm familiar with the concept of uh, nuclear energy. Yes. That, I mean, like, like in, a, in, in a nuclear reactor or a nuclear bomb. Yes. You're converting mass to energy. Correct. I, I get that bit. Yeah. But now you've thrown a different thing at me here that you can also convert it into gravitational waves. Yes. And my, my, head is, my head is exploding with this. <laughs> 
Um, but no, that's exactly true, Peter. That's exactly true in this case. And because of the power that's put in that way, we can actually, it makes a, a gravitational wave signal, signal that's strong enough um, for us to detect them here. Okay, Peter, if, if that makes sense and if there isn't any others. No, my my head will just have to explode. Go on then. <laughs> I see there's another question from Ivan O'Sullivan about white holes. You know, white holes are um, something that in theory could exist, but in practice, we have absolutely no evidence that they do. And whenever I'm asked about that, I, my answer is always that, one, that we're struggling so much to understand the black holes that we can find and detect um, and study in these galaxies. Um, no more than Peter, I think our heads would explode if we even had to consider um, trying to deal with white holes too. So um, they may exist from a theoretical point of view, but there's no, um, um, as I said, there's no uh, direct evidence for them. Okay, well, look, Paul, we won't impose on your time anymore. Thank you once again for a fantastic presentation. Well, absolutely. And thank you all for accommodating this, especially at such late notice. And lads, I really look forward to seeing you all in the, in the flesh, um, um, you know, sooner yeah. rather than later. Nope, you oh. may wish to rephrase that. But we, we know what you mean. <laughs> face to face. Face to face. Okay.